Hello, and welcome back to the advanced webinar, Integrating Remote Sensing into a Water Quality Monitoring Program. We are in part three of the webinar series with the theme, Aquatic Remote Sensing Skill Development and Best Practices. My name is Sherry Palacios, and my co-instructor is Amita Mehta. Today's session will be four hours long, some of it structured and some of it unstructured. We are covering a lot of material today, including lecture, demo, exercises, and some quiet laboratory work time at the end. It is not required that you remain for this quiet laboratory time, but you are welcome to use it to work on your exercises with the opportunity to ask Amita and me questions. We understand that we have a diverse audience of participants. We hope that each of you will come away from this series with some new knowledge and skill related to the remote sensing of aquatic systems and how it can complement a larger water monitoring program. Let's get started. The objectives of this training are to learn to understand which data products are used for water quality monitoring, follow rigorous practices for obtaining and processing aquatic remote sensing data, and to build skills in image processing for water quality monitoring for coastal and inland water bodies using NASA's CDAS image processing software. In part one, we focused on coastal systems, and during part two, we focused on remote sensing of inland waters. This week, we focus on building aquatic remote sensing skills and on best practices of incorporating remote sensing into a water quality monitoring program. As I mentioned at the beginning, we are going to cover a lot of information today. First, a review of parts one and two. Then I'll give a short lecture on a water quality monitoring program workflow and best practices and designing an effective water quality monitoring program using remote sensing. Amita will give a demo on using remote sensing in a water quality monitoring program. Then you will have an exercise on using remote sensing in a water quality monitoring program. I will then walk through the exercise on learning advanced skills with CDAS. And then with the time remaining, it will be a laboratory work time to finish the exercises and ask questions in an unstructured format. First, some highlights from parts one and two. In the first part, we reviewed some current satellite missions that are used for water quality monitoring. Space agencies and researchers have invested a great deal of effort to build this growing time series of Earth observations. This is a rich data set to mine to understand current water quality questions and to begin to understand how aquatic systems have changed since the beginning of the time series. Dr. Daniela Gerlin, our guest speaker from part two, gave a comprehensive overview of the water quality monitoring program she is a part of with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. She talked about the algorithm development she did to assess water clarity in Wisconsin lakes and shared links to the data visualization tools they make available to the public. If you have not already had a chance to browse those links, I encourage you to look at the PDFs of her presentation or to watch the recorded video to find the links. We very much appreciate her volunteering her time and expertise to help make this webinar series what it is. We touched on the advantages and disadvantages of using remote sensing for freshwater systems. Some advantages include a long and growing record of imagery for use in time series analysis ongoing commitment from space agencies to continue data collection, reliable data for operational warning and forecasting systems, and spatial resolution appropriate for lakes and freely available data of very high quality. Some disadvantages include issues with shallow water, so interference from the bottom, water bodies too small for the spatial resolution of sensors, limited number of standard algorithms for these optically complex waters, so a need to invest in algorithm development for a particular region, issues with atmospheric correction, and the choice of aerosol model to use over particular land regions. Freshwater systems are dynamic, and the temporal scale of change may be too fast for the revisit rate of sensors. And finally, ground truthing is costly. We would like to remind you that if you would like to receive a certificate of completion, you have homework due on Friday, June 21st. Something we thought we grew out of, but you have homework. There are three homework assignments, two of which must be submitted through Google Forms. There's no form to complete for the part two homework. 
You will need to complete the exercises in order to answer the homework questions in the forms. If you attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignments by this Friday, June 21st, you will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course. So let's get into the details of the water quality monitoring workflow and best practices. A few times during this webinar series, we have presented this general workflow that you see here for a water quality monitoring program that uses remote sensing. This workflow includes identifying your problem, evaluating if remote sensing can complement your in situ sampling effort, taking the time to choose sensors and appropriate data products for your problem, and in some cases, making the decision to develop your own data products for your region of interest building a strategy for coincident in situ and remote sensing observations using a parallel effort of in situ sample collection coincident with overflight of the imager, processing of in situ and imagery samples, and comparison of in situ observations with the estimates of corresponding data products using statistical methods, followed by the communication of results to the stakeholder. The ease of imagery access and processing can belie the amount of work that is needed for incorporating remote sensing into a water quality monitoring program. It is wise to carefully evaluate what the needs of a program are and if there are compatible remote sensing resources to augment the program. In the next few slides, I will review some of the considerations needed when designing an effective water quality monitoring program. During part one, we heard from you, our participants, of the wide range of experience levels and project ideas you have or are working on. It's really exciting for us to hear about the good work you are doing to monitor for water quality, to better understand ecosystems, and to protect human health. From monitoring small waterways in the forests of the state of Michigan, to discriminating between algae and mineral, mineral flocculants in the Salton Sea of California, to inland water fisheries data management in Indonesia, to monitoring pollution at sea near Spain, to wetland monitoring in Brazil, to shallow inland water bodies in South Africa. We have quite the diverse group of participants in this webinar series. While there is no one size fits all approach to integrating remote sensing into a water quality monitoring program, we offer more details to the workflow including logistics, incorporating citizen science, quality control, interpreting results, data management, and communicating to stakeholders. Some of you are just starting out in your journey of using remote sensing, and some of you have advanced programs. An effective water quality monitoring program requires a great deal of planning and a willingness to learn from your failures to build and improve your program. We hope that reviewing these considerations here will help you build an effective program while avoiding some of the pitfalls. If you are already a part of a water quality monitoring program, then you are most likely familiar with the in situ logistics. Your problem will drive which observations to make, such as chlorophyll concentration, turbidity, CDOM, or nutrients. You need to build a rigorous sampling design that takes into consideration the water depth, proximity to the shoreline being more than one pixel's distance away, and a stratified random sampling design so that observations within the water body are independent. If you're going to use data from a sensor that has a consistent tile with consistent pixel ground locations like Landsat 8 OLI, then you can plan for sampling with those locations in mind. Depending on how dynamic water movement is, or if you have vertically migrating organisms in the water, it is important to collect in situ observations within a narrow window of time on either side of the airplane or satellite overpass. If you're a part of an airborne campaign, this includes communicating with the pilots, or if they have an aircraft tracking tool like NASA does for some of its airborne platforms, then monitoring the plane's location using that tool. If you're syncing up with satellite overpass, there are online tools that provide the overpass predictions. NASA has one of these tools for commonly used aquatic satellite sensors in either airborne or satellite collections, and you are collecting measurements using 
a spectroradiometer, be sure to sample while the sun angle is 30 to 50 degrees from zenith. Not all satellites collect at this optimal angle for aquatic remote sensing, and this will be covered in the next couple of slides with the satellite overpass predictions. If your aquatic system is affected by tides or water release decisions, be sure to obtain the times to plan with them in mind. Schedule for boats and people. In these images that you see here on the right, you see Pinto Lake, California. It's a small lake near where I live in the Monterey Bay region of California in the US. The lake is known for toxic microcystis blooms. There's an ongoing sampling and remediation effort taking place in this lake to understand and why the blooms are so persistent and so toxic. And even though it is unsafe to eat fish caught from this lake, people still fish here. My former advisor and I have worked to develop bio-optical algorithms to observe and predict microcystis in this lake. One day we had an overflight scheduled to collect imagery. This is where I'm talking about contingencies. I was standing on the dock of the lake waiting to collect surf water surface reflectance measurements with my spectroradiometer. I'd set up all my equipment and I was ready for the plane to fly over in about five minutes and I was tracking it with the tracker tool. When this kid started casting his fishing rod at me and getting very close with the hook, I asked him to wait about 10 minutes until the plane was done, but he insisted on doing it. Thankfully, I had planned ahead and I knew that there was a parallel dock nearby and I was able to move before the overflight so I had a contingency plan and I was still able to collect samples. I don't think this young man was particularly happy about me talking to his parents after I finished sampling. A number of times participants have asked how small of a body of water can they sample using remote sensing observations. Please take a moment and look at the image on the left. It is a schematic illustration of pixels, land pixels in gray, water pixels in blue, and mixed pixels in some combination of blue and gray. Look closely here. Water bodies with at least three pixels in all directions are candidates for sampling, what we call the three pixel rule. Watch out though, because the mixed pixels limit our ability to monitor small water bodies. In fact, if you went by the three pixel rule for this schematic drawing that you see here, then the hypothetical body of water here would not be large enough to sample because it does not have three completely water pixels across in any one direction. Look at the image in the lower left. The false color of how it's displayed here provides a distinction between the land and water in this image. The reddish pixels include land. Using the three pixel rule, which bodies are candidates? These bigger ones are pretty good candidates. They are greater than three pixels across. These smaller bodies of water are too small for the pixel size to get an adequate um, set of data. So I've talked about it a couple of times, but where do you go to get those satellite overpass times so that you can schedule your in situ effort? <clears throat> NASA's Ocean Biology Processing Group has overpass predictor times for satellite sensors commonly used for aquatic remote sensing. In early June, I had a field sampling day to observe biofilms growing on the mudflats of San Francisco Bay. My colleagues and I wanted to know which day would be best to go sample. And we're interested in the MODIS, OLI, and OLCHI sensors. If you look here at the image on the left, you can see that I've clicked those sensors here. The date range is the one that I had here of the June 1st through June 6th. The location was an approximate location of where we were going to be sampling. And I wanted it in a table format. I submitted my request and it provided the image that you see on the right. And it's a bit cropped at the bottom. You can see at the top, Modus Aqua, midway down the image, OLI, and below that, OLCI from Sentinel-3A. Let's look at the columns of the table. It gives the date of the overpass, time and UTC, latitude and longitude, satellite azimuth and elevation, range, sun azimuth and angle, pointing direction of imager, and flags. 
Note the flags and below the table the meaning of those flags. For example, modus imagery to be collected on the 5th of June has a flag of three, meaning a satellite viewing angle that exceeds 45 degrees from zenith. And this oblique angle could result in distorted images. Modus imagery to be collected on the 6th has a sun glint warning. In both of these cases, this means that the data collected on those days will probably not be of the best quality for aquatic remote sensing. So maybe it'd be wise to choose a different day for sampling. These predictions are just that, predictions of when the satellite will be overhead of the location that you select. The predictions improve as you get closer to the date of interest. So it is a good idea to check it once to get the day and then start working on your logistics and then check the prediction a few times more closer to the date that you're going to sample to be sure to narrow down the time range of when the actual overpass will occur. It has become increasingly common to incorporate citizen science into research and monitoring programs. What kinds of activities are non-scientists actively engaged in for new discovery? Some activities include collecting measurements of water quality parameters, either directly via water sampling or indirectly using mobile apps like HydroColor, which gives you an idea of the color of the water and also a predicted spectral signature of the water. Mapping waterways or measuring flow. In cases where regulatory agencies may limit data collection to trained scientists, some agencies in the US have used citizen science to develop remote sensing algorithms and a hackathon type of competition. And finally, education and outreach is a type of activity for citizen science. If you'd like to learn more about citizen science programs related to water quality, we encourage you to check out some of these examples listed on the right. If you download the slides from today, you'll be able to use the active links in the PDF to connect to the different websites associated with these programs. The scientific enterprise is built on the foundation of trust, and it is in the quality control of data and our honesty in interpreting the data that we must instill in the community so that we can provide accurate information and trust the valid validity of the results. There are scientific considerations and regulatory considerations when we talk about quality control. For scientific considerations, this means using statistical appro approaches appropriate to the study problem. This can be related to experimental design, the sample size, the range of values observed, the correct handling and processing of samples, the rigorous use of statistics to establish thresholds for significance during the experimental design phase prior to collecting the samples, to establish the meaning of outliers in advance so the data analyst can objectively remove these observations without bias, so no cherry picking of the data to obtain a particular result. There are regulatory considerations as well. Many regulatory agencies, like the US Environmental Protection Agency, publish standards for water quality parameters and the protocols used to measure them. Use protocols published by your regulatory agency to guide your decisions for sample collection, quality control of data, data processing, data management, and communication. If your region does not have these, many regulatory agencies around the world openly publish these protocols and standards that you may use as a guide. Regulatory agencies set standards for water quality parameters at the federal, state or provincial or local level. These standards serve as benchmarks in statistically evaluating the observed water quality parameters. Sometimes an index or score like you see on the bottom right of this image here is derived from water quality parameters to quickly communicate the state of the water body. In this case, it's the very clearly defined red, yellow, and green, where green is good to excellent, marginal to fair for yellow, and red is poor. Information for remote sensing imagery can be aggregated into scoring systems such as these 
to provide information to stakeholders about a water body quickly without the need to train stakeholders on how to interpret the imagery. An important, albeit less glamorous, part of any water quality monitoring program, and especially one that uses the terabytes or more of data often needed for remote sensing imagery, is a well-defined data management plan. Much of the guidance you see on this slide may seem pretty obvious to many people, but it is worth mentioning. Data management includes building a plan for how you will manage and disseminate your program's data, store data products locally and off-site, like in the cloud, follow guidance for how to store metadata. This may be domain-specific or prescribed by law by your regulatory agency. No data management plan is effective if people don't know about it or how it works. Be sure to write up the data management plan and share it with your organization. Keep it updated as organizational processes or technology change, and have a plan for how you may share your program's data with external community data servers. A few years ago, I took a red eye to Washington, D.C. for a workshop, and the first day was an all-day meeting on how to comply with NASA's guidance for building a data management plan. My colleagues and I were groggy, and you might think the subject matter would not help, but boy, was I wrong. The Oak Ridge National Laboratory Distributed Active Archive Center gave the presentation on how to build an effective data management plan and provided best practices <clears throat> for preparing data sets and sharing externally and archiving. It was a lively and fun presentation, and my colleagues and I got a lot out of it. These presenters were passionate about preserving data integrity, and why not? Much of the data is related to the Earth science, and preserving its integrity and archiving it is essential for understanding the Earth and how it is changing due to climate change. I encourage you, again, to download the PDF of these slides so you can follow the active link at the top of this slide. The website covers so much more than just the best practices listed here, and it is really informative for any project that generates data. Their get guide, guidance for best practices include using stable file formats, defining the contents of the data files, using descriptive file names, using consistent data organization, preserving information with version control, documenting your data, performing basic quality assurance, protecting your data, and publishing your data. I encourage you to check out their website. If you're ever planning to submit a proposal for NASA funding, you will be required to have a well-defined data management plan, and this website addresses the topics that you'll need to cover. So in this section of the lecture on designing an effective water quality monitoring program using remote sensing, we've reviewed logistics related to both in situ and remote sensing observations, incorporating citizen science, scientific and regulatory considerations for the quality control of the data, interpreting results both in terms of responding to regulatory benchmarks and the visualization of data, and the best practices of data management and dissemination. The next few slides are about communicating results to stakeholders. The ideas presented here are not just specific to remote sensing, but capture communication guidelines for any water quality monitoring program. There will be a lot of information in the next eight slides, but at a high level, the ideas for communicating to stakeholders are captured here. Know your audience. Use clean and concise language appropriate for your audience's reading level. Limit the number of main points in your message. Use figures or graphics that deliver the message on their own. If numbers are used, explain what they mean. If risk is communicated as a probability, explain the meaning of that probability and cite your sources. So if you're involved in a water quality monitoring program, we'd like to hear a little bit from you and have you share with the other participants as well. What we're interested in finding out is who are your stakeholders and how do you communicate to them? And also, what are some tips that you would provide to others who may be in your position, maybe people who are just starting out on how to communicate to stakeholders? We'd like to hear from you. So if you could please take just a moment 
and look at that questions section of the webinar software and type in your answers there. We'd really appreciate it. We really want to hear from you. The next several slides provide guidance for water quality monitoring communication. I found this guidance through the source you see listed at the bottom of this slide, that link, and I encourage you to take a look at the paper. This paper reviewed the communication efforts of water quality monitoring programs in the U.S. that had agreed to adopt the communication guidelines of the Center, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and you see the link for that listed to the right of that. These guidelines are listed here on the left. Some of the programs cited in this article at the bottom had complied, others only partly, and some not at all. These guidelines suggest that communication coming from a water quality monitoring program include each of the following. A main message or call to action for the water quality problem. Language that can be understood by the audience. Information is presented clearly. The science used is justified and well, well sourced. It gives behavioral recommendations. If numbers are presented, they're explained. If risk is communicated, it's explained. And we will walk through each one of these in more detail. So first, the main message or call to action. Does the material contain one message? Is the main message at the top, beginning, or front of the material? Is the main message emphasized with visual cues? Does the material contain at least one visual that conveys or supports the main message? Does the material include one or more call to action for the primary audience? Language. Do both the main message and the call to action use the active voice? Does the material always use language the primary audience would use? For example, if your audience reads at a high school level, be sure to write the message at the same reading level as your audience. Does your message contain uncommon terms or scientific terms? Be sure to define them and always try to avoid jargon as much as possible. Information design. Is the most important information the primary audience needs summarized in the first paragraph or section? In communications and journalism, this idea is called the inverted pyramid style. You present the lead, the most important information, usually who, what, when, where, why, how, at the very beginning. Then the text contains additional facts or details in order of importance, arguments, background, evidence. And the end is information that is nice, but not necessary. This is a great way of writing articles or blog posts, but also reports. People are busy or have short attention spans and often scan text rather than sitting down and reading it. I know I'm guilty of this too. A lot of people are, maybe not you. This inverted pyramid approach structures the writing so that people can get the most information out of something with the least amount of effort. Also, is the material organized in chunks with headings? Does the material use bulleted or numbered lists? State of the science. Does the material explain what authoritative sources, such as subject matter experts and agency spokespersons, know and don't know about this topic. So let's say your bulletin provides some information. Is there a person that the audience member can contact or an agency contact that they can meet with to understand it better? Behavioral recommendations. Does the material include one or more behavioral recommendations for the primary audience? Don't fish. Does the material explain why the behavioral recommendations are important? Do the behavioral recommendations include specific directions about how to perform the behavior? Numbers. Does the material always present numbers the primary audience uses? Will your audience understand what those numbers mean? And do you include units with the numbers? Does the material always explain what the numbers mean? Do you have some sort of key that helps the audience understand the meaning of those numbers? And does the audience have to conduct math or calculations to understand the point that you're trying to make? 
because you know if they're in a hurry, this will probably not happen. Is your number data presented as maps of remote sensing imagery? These are numbers just presented with a color scheme and a color bar to aid in interpretation. Do you provide resources so that your audience can interpret the meaning of the maps you're presenting? Do you provide uncertainty estimates or ranges associated with your remote sensing estimates? Does your audience understand how to interpret those uncertainty estimates? With remote sensing imagery, it's really easy to fall into the trap of thinking that the results are self-evident to the viewer. Remember that your audience may not have the same experience reading maps as you do. They may be unfamiliar with landmarks that are familiar to you. Be sure when presenting maps of information, they are well labeled, the data products being used are described, and the estimated values for those products are clearly identified, and when possible, their uncertainty estimates are included. Risk. Does the material explain the nature of the risk? Does the material address both the risks and benefits of the recommended behaviors? If the material uses numeric probability to describe risk, is the probability also explained with words or a visual? Humans struggle with understanding risk. Help them in your communications by being straightforward about which risks are being reported and what that means in concrete terms that your audience will understand. We understand that these past few slides have covered a lot of material related to the communication of water quality monitoring efforts. We encourage you to download the PDF of this presentation. I encourage anyone who is working on a water quality monitoring program to read the paper that is cited at the bottom of the slide. I learned a lot from it. So we'd like to take a moment to review some of the main teachings of this webinar series. The training objectives were to understand which data products are used for water quality monitoring, to talk about rigorous practices for obtaining and processing aquatic remote sensing data, and to build skills in image processing for water quality monitoring for coastal and inner inland water bodies using NASA's CDAS image processing software. We presented a general workflow that can be used to incorporate remote sensing into a water quality monitoring program with the flexibility to customize or create new algorithms for a particular region of interest. We talked about the importance of using remote sensing data to augment an in situ monitoring program and the need for rigorous practices to ground truth data throughout the monitoring program so that the observations made through remote sensing imagery are quantitatively valid. We cited several case studies of water quality monitoring programs that incorporate remote sensing observations. One of these case studies was presented by our guest speaker, Dr. Daniela Gerlin of the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. She talked about their satellite water clarity monitoring program in Lakes of Wisconsin. She and her department also generously provided data for us to use in our demonstration and exercises using CBAS to validate satellite data products in using in situ water measurements. Through the course of this webinar, including skills we have covered today, we have provided information to you on data access and download using NASA's Ocean Color Web Level 1 and 2 browser, the CBAS Data Access Portal, the Ocean Biology Processing Group's Overpass Predictor, and the USGS Earth Explorer. We have covered many skills in CDAS in this course, or we're about to cover them. Uh, in part one, uh, you learned the basic skills from CDAS, like defining land masks, identifying flags, creating color bars, exporting an image, reprojecting, and cropping. Today, you will learn more about co-locating bands, band math, building a mask, statistics, filtering, extracting, mosaicing images, linking in situ data from a CBAS format to imagery, and processing between levels to derive data products and perform atmospheric correction using the OCSSW processors. We'd like to remind you to complete all of the exercises from part one and three in order to know the answers on the Google Form homework. Those homeworks for parts one and three are due this Friday, June 21st, if you wish to earn a certificate of completion. Looking ahead today, 
Amita will give a demonstration using remote sensing in a water quality monitoring program. Then following from the demo, Amita will be walking through the exercise using data and methods from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. After that, I will return for more skill building using CDAS. With time remaining, we will have an open laboratory work time for you to complete the exercises and ask questions. Much of this time will be quiet and periodically we will turn on the audio to answer questions that have come in through the chat feature on the webinar software. Like we warned you, today is full. So let's get started. In this next section, Amita will be presenting a demonstration using remote sensing in a water quality monitoring program. This is a brief demonstration, and it's more or less a continuation of what we did last week. If you recall, we downloaded a Lancet Oli level one image for 23rd of September 2014 using USGS Earth Explorer. Then we converted this level one data to level two by using OCSSW in CDAS. So today what we're going to do is compare chlorophyll A concentration from Lancet level two image that we generated last week and compare them with measurements in situ measurements from Rock Lake and Geneva Lake. Both of these are in Wisconsin. These in-situ data were provided to us by Dr. Daniela Gerlin, who was our guest speaker last week. And uh, thank you, Daniela, for providing this in-situ measurements so we can compare remote sensing-based chlorophyll with in-situ chlorophyll data. And to do so, we are going to first start with in-situ data file that we received from Wisconsin DNR. We are going to rewrite this file as a text file in a format that is readable by CDAS, and that is in CBAS format. So we will briefly talk about that. Then once we rewrite this file, we can import that in-situ data file and Lancet Level 2 image both in CDAS and compare chlorophyll values from both these sources for these two lakes. Also, you will be conducting a very similar exercise at the end of the presentation during the lab time. Only thing is that you will be using Lancet image for 1st September 2015 and in situ data which were coincident with overpass of this image the Lancet at, uh, on that day are Lake Mendota and Lake Wow, Besa, these two are from Wisconsin as well. And uh, Daniela provided in situ data again for these uh, two cases also. Now, uh, your homework for last week was to download this image, level one image, and then convert it to level two by using OCSSW. We have heard from a few participants that there were some difficulties sometimes in either installation or execution of OCSSW. So what we have done is we have uh, provided this image in on our website. So Lancet level two uh, data are already converted and they're available on our website so that you can download and continue working with this exercise um, during the lab time. So what we're going to do now is start with CBAS format information. CBAS is CWIF's bio-optical archive and storage system. CWIF was one of the earlier NASA ocean color mission, and CBAS was said to have in-situ data for this mission. A number of cruises were there and in-situ data were taken. So this portal was set up so that uh, in-situ data can be uh, placed here for everybody to use. And you can browse through all the links here to learn more about it. What we are going to do is we are going to use the same format that CBAS uses. We are going to look, we are going to start with in situ lake data and convert them into the same format so that CDAS can do this file. So here in contribute data, submitting overview has information about data format that is required by CDAS to read the file, these two data file. 
So a few important points here. First, the file has to be a text file. You can use text editor on your computer to create this file. Uh, data themselves are actually columns. They are delimited by spaces, tabs, or commas. Any one file can use just one of these delimiters. And um, one of the important things to note here is that there is a he header part to this file. M metadata are given in this header, and we'll see an example for that. Also, here there is a link to field names and units. This is very important. Here on in this side, in this column, all the in situ data that can be measured or they were measured uh, earlier, they are described here. And corresponding field name that has to be specified in CBAS file, they, they, these names are given here. And units for each of the variables are also given here. So for us, we're going to focus on chlorophyll concentration. And CHL is the field name for chlorophyll. So we're going to use that. But if you have some other uh, observed in situ parameters, then you can look at the field name and specify that. Field names and units are not case sensitive. But important thing to note here at the end is that the header should not include any white space. We will go through some of these options when we look at the file. But main thing to keep in mind is that there has to be a header. File has to be in text format, no white spaces, and one of these delimiter has to be used. So if you go back to metadata header link, here is an example at the end of a header. It starts with this slash begin underscore header, and it ends with slash and underscore header. Again, there are no blank spaces here. Here, all the fields, they don't have to be in any particular order. Uh, and these, they're all not uh, mandatory fields either. You can specify investigators, affiliation, contact, etc., which crews or what kind of in situ data. Is there a station ID? Uh, all these meta metadata can be provided here. You can provide start date and end date here, start time and end time for the in situ measurements. These four parameters, so north and south latitudes and east and west longitudes, all in degrees. They are the uh, maximum or extreme north and south and east and west points. So if you have multiple in situ measurements, they fall within this polygon. So these are the corner points, east, west, uh, south, and north. So they have to be specified. These data, so water depth in meter, the, um, if some field is not applicable, you can say NA. These data are not mandatory again, but if you have them, you can put them here in header for your measurement. So, so this is Seki depth, cloud percent, wind speed, wave height. If you have in situ measurements for these parameters, you can specify them here for analysis. Another important thing is that you have to specify which delimiter you're going to use. In this case, tab is used. Next, you specify data fields that are included in data file. So here, there are time, depth, chlorophyll concentration. This is a type of pigmentation, and this is total pigmentation concentration. And units have to be specified for each of these. So time is in hour, minute, second. Depth is in meter. Chlorophyll concentration in milligrams per meter cube. And pigmentation, they are in milligram per meter cube as well. And then data have to be placed here in columns with delimiters. So this is a typical CBAS uh, file format. And data have to be written like this to be able to uh, read in CDAS. So next, we are going to do the same. We are going to start with in situ data and put them in this format. So this is 
the file that was provided by Wisconsin DNR. And you can see that it's an Excel file with field ID, station ID, station name. So these are the um, lakes. Here are the station type, uh, official, water body name. So you can see that this is a big file with several in situ measurements. Not only that, here you have latitude, longitude, date, and time, you know, persons who collected the data. There is information about cloud cover, wind speed, wind direction, air temperature, barometric pressure. Uh, all these data are available. And now you can see that water temperature, dissolved oxygen, conductivity, specific conductivity, secchi depth, water color, turbidity, these are all organic carbon. These are all available in situ measurements. And there is chlorophyll concentration here in microgram per liter. As we saw earlier, we require, CDAS requires that uh, chlorophyll concentration be in milligrams per meter cube. In this case, microgram per liter actually is equivalent to milligram per meter cube, so we can use these numbers as they are. But if not, then you have to make sure that everything is in proper unit as we saw in this CBAS format. There are other like uh, sediments are there, phosphates, a multiple in situ data are there. We are going to work with chlorophyll concentration today. And you can explore this data further if you like. What I have done is that I have just isolated or subsisted data in this file, there are overlapping observations, in situ observations overlapping with Lancet overpass. There are six points in two lakes, so three in each, and they are given here. And everything else is here. There is uh, concentration values here. Um, you can also see that there is, um, I know that there is depth information, uh, how deep the lake is at the place of observation. Uh, that is available in, in this. Yeah, so station depth in, in meters, so this is how deep the lake is. So what we have to do is write this data into CBAS format. And I have already done so, so I'm just going to show this sample to you. This is the header information. These are the extreme north, south, east, west longitudes. And all we have, I have used millimeter comma here. And fields are station ID, latitude, longitude, time, depth, and chlorophyll concentration. And these are the units. If there are no units, you can say none. So the station, there's no unit. Latitude, longitude, and degrees, time in hour, minute, and second, depth in meter. And this is in, I've kept milligram per meter cube which is equivalent to microgram per liter. And these are the numbers with comma separating each column. So this is it's fairly simple. And right now, we just have six points. If you have more points, you will be adding more points in here as well. If you have other fields, you can add other fields here, units here, and then add those numbers here in these rows. So this is how you will be uh, creating in situ data. Next, we are going to get this file into CDAS along with our Lancet image. So let me close some of these and start with CDAS. 
So I have opened CDAC already, and this is the image for 23rd September 2014 that we converted to level two last week. And if you remember, we used this mask manager to turn this cloud ice mask on so that only the water bodies show up in here. That's the threshold um, that is set up in CDAS so that it works that way. And now what we can do is get the in-situ data in here. If you go to on top and look at this icon, it is import field measurements. You can click on here and you can go to the CBAS format text file that you created. I just saw that. You open that and it puts all the measurements where they are taken easy to measurements. You can zoom in. So this is Rock Lake and So now what we want to do is compare the data. You already have chlorophyll concentration in the lake from Landsat, and you have three points here. You want to see how remote sensing based chlorophyll concentration compares with this in situ data at these points. So, what we're going to do is go here. You hover it says display correlative plot for a selected band. Once you click on it, it asks you for some information. Here, box size is, it tells you how many pixels to consider where there is in situ data. So here we have just said, just take one pixel from Landsat image where there is in situ data. Point data source is the file that you created. And this is CHL, this is the Landsat data, and it comes up with this plot. Uh, we just have three observations in each layer which coincide with this over pass. And so that's all we have for now. We can say show regression line. This line actually is, is fitted to the data that you see here. Here is the Lancet uh, part of chlorophyll and this is in situ chlorophyll. As you can see, uh, there is reasonable comparison here. You can what you can do is change the box size that you consider. Here you can look at three. So when you change one here, this is the correlation coefficient, and these are the coefficients for this line. Um, so what you can do is change this, say three by three pixel, and then correlation coefficient improves. It is 0.85 or 0.86. If you go to five, it even improves the correlation gets better. It's 0.87 here. And as you can see, the, there's the line, these measurements are Landsat based and in situ, they do fall along this line, except for this point. And if you go back and check this point, here is where you will see that the lake depth was less than all these other points. So perhaps there is some bottom effect that is seen uh, in Lancet, and that's why there is less agreement between the two uh, measurements here. But this is basically how you can compare uh, Lancet and chlorophyll data. You can see that there are biases. Uh, here, uh, high the values are up to six. Here, eight, 8.5 in Lancet. So uh, there is the chlorophyll concentration is a little larger as seen by Landsat compared to in situ data. And this is not completely surprising. Um, and we can discuss this. You can also think about it why 
there, you would not be surprised to see the differences. We'll discuss this later when you go through the exercise for another image that we are going to see now. So, so um, one thing to note here is that we just have six points overlapping with satellite data. And statistically, this line fitting will not be significant. We, last week, uh, Daniela Berlin showed us that they used a couple of thousands of observations to develop their algorithms for the lakes. So you actually need a lot more data. So a lot more in situ uh, data coincident with satellite overpass only then you would be able to develop a statistically significant algorithm. Here, this was shown mostly to, as an example, that how you can do that. But ideally, you would have enough observations so that you can have robust coefficients or correlation between uh, satellite data and in situ data. So now next, you have, you know, during the lab time, you will be following these steps with a 2015 September image. And you can download level two image from our website. You already have Excel file for 2015. You will be making that uh, in CDAS format, and then you will be uh, comparing in CDAS just as we did here. So I'm going to uh, end this demo now here and hand this back to Sherry. And then during the lab time, then you can come back and do the uh, similar exercise. So thank you, and Sherry, back to you. In this section, I will be presenting the exercise Advanced Skills with CDAS. If you look at your webinar software, you'll see that there are handouts, and the PDF for this exercise should be located there, and it will also be located on the course website. So when I refer to page numbers as I go through this exercise, what I'm referring to are the page numbers that are in this document. This is the first page that you see here of the document. So advanced skills with CDAS. The objectives for this exercise is, are to learn how to co-locate bands, to do band math, to understand how to use the statistics tool, to filter a band and just understand what that might look like and why you might use it, to do pixel extraction, and to combine or mosaic two images. I'm going to be navigating out of this document now. Um, so uh, if you've already printed it up and you're following along, that's great. Um, if not, you may want to pop it up and down in your computer screen so you can follow along as I go through this. So I'm going to go ahead and open CDAS and um, uh, then do some file management. So I'm going to exit out of there. And you can see here um, I've done some of the file management. I have my RSET training folder and uh, CDAS advanced skills. I've created a, a folder named that. If you recall from part one, we did Swanee River. We used these files to um, uh, go through the skills that we learned there, including reprojecting and then cropping or building a subset. I've already actually done this step where I've moved the files over to CDAS Advanced Skills to use for this part three exercise. So what I recommend that you do is number three on page three for beginning steps is to go ahead and copy the files over from part one to part three. And these are the reprojected subset files. So if I go to Swanee River here, you can see that I have these subset files located here. Ignore these here that just say reprojected. The ones that we're going to be using for this Part three exercise are going to be the IOP reprojected subset data.data.dim files, the OC reprojected subset .data.dim files, and the SST reprojected subset .data.dim. Go ahead and launch CDAS if you haven't already done so. On page four, I gave you an important note 
that these reprojected files needed to all be cropped with the same geographic coordinates. If you have not already done this exercise, the part one exercise and cropped to the same dimensions, then I recommend that you pause and go back and do that now so that you'll have the right data for this exercise. <clears throat> okay, so I've launched CDAS. I don't want to check on a new version. I'm just going to leave that alone. And I'm going to look at the data management here just to confirm. I have my RSET training folder, CDAS advanced skills, Swanee River, and then I have, um, I added this extra folder of Swanee River, but in the image here on page five, you see that I just skip right over to the subsets. So the six subset files that you see in the image on page five match these subset files that I just listed for you just a moment ago. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start with co-locate bands. I'm now on page six. I'm going to go here to back to my CDAS window. And from the um, CDAS advanced folder, I'm going to open these subset.dim files for each of the um, types of data that I want, the OC, SST, and IOP. Okay, and you can see that those um, files are opening then on the left-hand file manager pane here in the CDAS window. Open that up a little bit so we can see it a little bit better. So in the CDAS at the menu bar, I'm going to click on raster co-locate. So raster drop-down menu co-locate. This is going to open the create co-located file. I'm going to select OC file as the reference file. So I can just use this, since these are already opened in the file manager, I can just do this drop-down this, um, drop menu. So I'm going to choose OC as the reference file, and C surface temperature, SST, as the dependent file. So looking here, it should match, this upper part should match the image that you see on the right on page 7. And then you want to look at your output name. Um, we want to give it a meaningful name. Uh, and what we're going to give it is what you see here listed in the image. Um, and we're going to cheat a little bit. We're going to use, oops, we're going to um, go ahead and type it out. So A2015. And uh, let's see, OC underscore SST reprojected. We're going to save it as a beam uh, dimap, which is the default. And we're going to verify that it's going into the correct folder. And the folder that I have listed here just has that additional folder, the Swanee River folder in there, just because I wanted to keep it a little bit more um, localized. Um, I'm going to leave the rest of these as the default. And, um, and because we've already reprojected these using bilinear, I'm going to leave the nearest neighbor resampling. So I'm going to go ahead and click Run and wait for a moment. Okay, it gives me a notice saying that I've run it correctly. I'm now looking at page eight. We're going to repeat this co-locate step using the newly co-located file as the reference file and the IOP file as independent. So using this drop down, we're going to use that. Uh, the newly, you can see OC, SST, and then the IOP as the dependent. We want to give it a new name under output. You don't want to overwrite the original one, or the, the one that we just created. So we want to add IOP to the name here so you can see it written out in the output. And just verify that we're putting it in the same location that, that we want to put it into, which is in the Swanee River one. We're leaving it as nearest neighbor. When you're ready and you feel satisfied that you have matching um, information here, go ahead and click Run and wait. Okay, so when processing is done, go ahead and click OK. 
<clears throat> we're going to close all the files except for this newly um, collocated file. So we're going to go ahead and close the um, collocate file window. And then I'm going to scooch this out a little so you can see the whole file name. We're going to go ahead and close everything except for this last one that you see here. At least that's the order it's um, formatted for me and my file manager. So right click close. And then clicking on the rasters folder in the file manager, you notice that there are a lot of bands now and they have appended on them these R's and D's. And that gives you a record of which one was being used as a reference and which one was re being used as a dependent. So it makes sense that the IOP um, file that you were working with, remember it has the um, backscattering, the BB, the um, absorption um, by detritus and Gelbstoff at 443, um, that that was the last one that you did and you chose it to be the dependent and that's why it has the D appended on the end. Okay, so what we'd like for you to do next is to look at this chlorophyll A one. We're just, just for now, just ignore these appended um, letters here. If you were going to be using this method for your own work, it might make sense to change the naming on these, but for just the default, we just wanted to just leave that alone and just ignore those for now. So we're gonna double click on chlorophyll, get it to display. Okay, this should look familiar to you from part one. Um, <clears throat> We can also look at some of the other bands in this region. So you may want to just take a second, we're still on page nine, number 12, and just open a couple of the other bands. So let's see, KD490, whoa, that's just in black and white. I'm just gonna skip ahead. Normalized fluorescence line height. That's artifacts of those lines in there, it's pretty common. Sea surface temperature, Pretty familiar with this one because we were looking at that quite a bit. And then I'm going to also open up the ADG um, 443 one. You see there. I'm going to close NFLH and KD490 for now and go back to chlorophyll just for viewing. So if you prefer to reduce the number of bands in your file, so you're not looking at this humongous number of bands over here that you're probably not even gonna use, um, you can repeat using the crop tool. And instead of doing a spatial cropping like you did um, in the previous part, you can do a band subset. Um, and so we're gonna do that now. So instead of spatial subset, we're gonna do a band subset. sure that the full scene is visible. And um, what we're gonna do is looking at the uh, image that you see here, we're gonna deselect some of these. So I'm gonna go ahead and deselect AOT and the angstrom. I'm gonna leave all the RRS, remote sensing reflectances, in place. I'm gonna keep chlor A. You can see this, um, there's a table right next to the image on page 10 where I tell you which ones to keep. So without reading off every single one of them, right now I'm just gonna verify that I'm actually keeping the ones that I say that I wanna keep. So I'm take them out. Removing a lot of the IOP ones. And what this does, the benefit of the band subset, as you can probably already guess, is that by removing these layers in the data file, we are making the file in a manageable size. So we don't choke our system trying to do processing on it. Because if we're really not interested in some of these uh, data layers that are in here, there's really no use having them um, take up space. And the reason why I didn't do this step earlier is I just wanted to get through the spatial subset and have you guys understand that concept um, before jumping along to this one. But I could have done both of these steps when we cropped in part one um, as one step, one unified step. So what I'll do is I'll just verify that I have the ones that I want. Whoops, I accidentally took off that one and should have kept it. And I'm pretty satisfied that I am keeping the ones that I want and dropping the ones that I don't. Okay, I am satisfied with this. 
<clears throat> okay, going back to the spatial subset, just verify metadata subset. Okay, I'm going to click OK. This will create a new file that will be visible in your um, pan the file manager here. You'll notice that uh, it popped up down at the bottom. Be sure to right click on this file to save it. So save as. Yes, we really want to save it. And yeah, it's going to have this kind of ugly name. Um, it's giving us a default name. Let's see if it'll provide the opportunity. Yes, it will. To change it. So what we want to call it is, we want to call it what you see here on page 10, a 2015 l 2 underscore LAC underscore combined dot DIM. Okay. And that should save it. Let's just verify. Yep, it's there. And what we want to do is we'll close these layers. And we're going to close the other file that we used. OK, so when you click on rasters, now you can see a much more manageable list here in the file manager pane. Now let's open chlorophyll, sea surface temperature, and the ADG443 GIOP data layers. And from now forward, I'm just going to refer to the ADG file as just ADG, like I did in part one. So there's the chlorophyll, there's sea surface temperature, and the ADG. So this is great. We've got all these nice files that we're viewing in the image viewer. Okay, so after you've had a chance to view these, we're just going to go ahead and close these layers across the way here. Okay, so we're now on page 11 and we're looking at uh, band math or math bands, depending on how you want to think of it. Uh, sometimes it's, gainful to, it, it's helpful to gain insight from imagery by performing math on the bands. Just gives you an idea of, oh, I what the, wonder what the ratio of this color is to that color. Um, if you're familiar with using NDVI, uh, that's one pretty simple way to think about band math is with the NDVI, the ratio of um, some of the bands. NASA uses a number of chlorophyll algorithms um, because the conditions can vary from one part of the world to the next. And what's interesting about chlorophyll algorithms that we don't really talk about in this webinar series, but we covered in the fundamentals, is that fundamentally the chlorophyll algorithm comes down to a polynomial equation that's been fit, and it uses the ratio of one, um, ratio, one color band to another color band and as one of the coefficients in, the, in the, this equation. And so band math is a really effective way. You could actually write out the chlorophyll algorithm here if you wanted to. Band math is one way to observe the data and even to compute data products. So if you ever get to the point where you're doing algorithm development, using the simple band math tool is one approach that you could take to quickly seeing, oh, am I estimating chlorophyll using my new algorithm? And you can use this band math tool. It's pretty cool that you can get so far with image processing and using some of these simple tools. If you want to know more about the chlorophyll A algorithms that NASA uses, on page 11 is a link to the Ocean Color website, and it talks about the chlorophyll A um, algorithms that are used for the different sensors and also under which conditions it's most likely to be used. So for this band math section, instead of focusing on chlorophyll, we're going to work on something called the CI, or the color index, which can be used as an intermediate step to compute chlorophyll. This CI is different than the um, cyanobacterial index that we covered in the part two lecture. This is the color index. Uh, and if you did look at the link that was located on page 11, it goes into a little bit more detail on what the CI is. But in the middle of page 12, you see the equation for CI. And basically what it's doing is it's taking the remote sensing reflectance at three, for three different bands at the wavelengths of 443, 555 and 667 nanometers. It's using those that information from those bands and also what the wavelengths are, and it's computing this number, the CI. So we're going to go ahead and give a try at calculating this CI. They then, for the algorithm, take CI and do more with it, but the CI is this intermediary step, and it's pretty straightforward how to calculate it using band math. 
So your CDAS window should be open and you should still have this file open that we combined in the earlier section. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up the remote sensing reflectance data layers or image layers corresponding to the colors that are listed in the table on the bottom of page 12. So at, man, at wavelength 443, 555, and 667. I'm going to go ahead and apply the um, land masks to each of these. And um, I like my land mask to be black, but you can choose whatever color you want. And then the next thing that I'd like for you to do is to tile the images horizontally. So at the, the menu bar across the top is to tile horizontally. I'm going to synchronize them and zoom all, as you see me doing down here in the navigation controls. I might see if I can, no. So my image here looks a little bit different than what you're seeing on um, page 13, but you get the idea of what we're aiming for. So now I'm at the top of page 14, number four, and we're gonna start working with this, uh, the math band tool. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna go across the top in my menu bar where it says raster, click on it, and the drop-down menu gives me math band, dot, 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 the ellipses. So I'm gonna go ahead and select that. And it's, what it's gonna do is it's going to open a window called Create Logical Expression Math Band. And if you look at the image on page 14, you can see what I have here. Um, it gives the target file. So it's listed the correct file. It's the only one that's open in my pane. And I'm going to change the name. So it's going to default to some name. I'm going to choose a name for it. I'm going to call it CI. Spectral wavelength, I'm just going to leave it as it is. For now, I'm just going to save it, have it be a virtual save. And replace NAN, I'm just going to leave that as the default. The next thing that I want to do is I want to click on this button here that says Edit Expression. And that's going to open up the Expression Editor. I'm now on page 15. So what we're going to do now is we're going to enter the equation uh, for the CI. And you can see it listed here in the expression um, part of the expression editor. Um, you could also use the equation that we provided for you on the middle of page 12 of this laboratory or this exercise. OK, so we recommend using the functions as much as possible when you are typing in your expression. It is possible to type it on the keyboard, but we recommend using the functions. And by that, I mean these tools down the middle and also instead of typing in the band name, using this band um, choice that under the data sources. So I'm going to give this a go. Um, let's see. Okay, so it's always a good idea to hold your 
the printout here to see if it actually matches what I'm aiming for. And I have all of the parentheses in the correct location. And I've identified the bands and the wavelengths that I'm using in the expression editor. So I'm just taking a moment and I'm reviewing that. If you're brave, I encourage you to go ahead and just try to type these in and see if you how your results turn out. I've learned from experience that sometimes it's best to just use the tools that they provide. OK. So I am satisfied that what I have typed in here with the expression editor is what I actually want the CI calculation to be. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And then I'm going to click OK again. You can see that it filled this band map. Math band expression. I highly recommend if you're ever going to type in an equation, you use the expression editor. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK, and it's going to work on it. And it's now created this new data layer that you see um, located in the list of rasters. It's a virtual band, band, and that's why it has a V here on the icon. I'm going to go ahead and right click, and I'm going to turn it into a real band. Okay. It should have also popped up in the viewer, as you see mine has done here. And um, it should, uh, I'm going to go ahead and give it a land mask. Okay. I'm going to zoom all for it. Going back to the file manager, I am going to uh, Notice it's the stack of pancakes with the red sauce. That means that we want to go ahead and save it. So I'm going to right click on the file name and save as, and I'm just going to overwrite it for what it was. Yes, I want to overwrite it. Okay, so across the top here, I'm going to go ahead and close these image layers. And just to do one last view, I'm going to go ahead and look at the CI, because I'd just like for you to look at some of the patterns that you might be observing in it. And this is not actually listed in the laboratory exercise, but I just want to show it to you here. I'm going to use this um, chlorophyll uni BR palette, even though it isn't actually chlorophyll. Um, I just want to, um, to view it in that way. So I've just adjusted on the sliders to look at 95% of the data just to stretch it out a little bit. I'm going to play around with the log feature here. I turned off log. Okay, so this is a little bit more meaningful to me. Look at 100% of the data. So it gives you an idea of some of the patterns that you might see using the CI. Remember, this is not the final chlorophyll concentration, but it gives you an idea of, yeah, you can see some of the patterns in the data um, from the CI. Um, it will be a building block that's used for the chlorophyll tool. And if I were to look at the chlorophyll um, tool or data layer, excuse me, um, I would then be able to compare it and just visually, let's take a look at it, tile horizontally, view the range. You can see it's in some ways it's an inverse of the pattern of what you would expect to see with the chlorophyll. Um, and that's normal. It's just a, a one of the parameters that's used in the chlorophyll algorithm. Okay, so let's go ahead now and close these data layers. Go back to the file manager. And I'm turning the page now so that we are on page 17, and we're going to start in with the statistics tool. To open the sea surface temperature layer, and if yours applies the landmass, great. If it doesn't automatically apply it, um, please do so now, just so it's easier to see the terrain here and the features. We're going to be looking a little bit over here at this geolocation information, and we're also going to be using the, the pin manager tool. So slightly different way than what you learned how to use it in part one. So you've opened sea surface temperature. I'd like for you to click on the pin tool. Resize the window if you need to. And before we do anything there, I just want you to drag your um, cursor over this region here just to get an idea of what the latitude and longitude is that you're looking at. This is the region of the mouth of the Suwannee River. Now, I could ask you to just drop your pin here, but what I'd actually like for you to do is I'd like for you to use this pin tool to actually drop it in the exact location that I'm asking you, where I'm asking you to drop it. 
So please go back down to this pin manager window that you have open. And what you want to do is you want to click on create a new pin. And this opens this window called new pin. And you want to label your new pin Swanee R underscore mouse. I'm going to leave description alone, and then I'm going to give it my location. This is a really great way to be able to like make sure that when you have, say, a mooring or a ship location, you can identify exactly where that is in the image. Now, you're not going to probably do a one pixel comparison to that particular ship location or mooring location, because typically we get a box of pixels around that location. But at least you know, OK, as a starting point, this is where the mooring was located. Okay, let's move on to the longitude 83.0. Okay, and I'll just leave all the rest of it as it is. And then I'm going to go ahead and click OK. So I'm going to navigate to the mask manager. You can see here the image um, shows you the Swanee, Swanee River mouse. The pin has been dropped right there. Um, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be creating a mask between particular temperature range in a particular temperature range. Um, and then we're going to run the statistics on the only the data that fall within that temperature range. So first, I need to create a mask that masks for that temperature range. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to go to the mask manager. Move the pin manager out of the way. In the mask manager, you'll notice the ex expression editor icon. It's very similar, and we don't want you to be confused. We are looking at the mask manager expression editor. Do not confuse this particular icon with the expression editor for band math. That one is located up here on the toolbar. We want this one that is on the mask manager. So we're going to go ahead and click on it. And it's going to create a logical expression math. It's very similar user interface, but it, um, we want to make sure that you're using the one in the mask manager. We're going to create a mask that includes sea surface temperatures in the range of 9 to 13 degrees Celsius. On page 19, you see this window open. And we're just going to use, similar to the effort that we just did with the um, math, the band math, we're going to do the same kinds of tasks um, with the expression editor. Um, the tools are a little bit different down the middle, but you still get the same idea of um, the data sources. So what we want to do is we want to show bands, but we don't want to see show single flags. See that as our data sources. And what we want to do is we're going to set up these logical expressions. So we'll choose, go ahead and choose the sea surface temperature band that we're, or excuse me, data layer that we're working with. So we want sea surface temperature less than or equal to 13. So less than or equal to 13. And surface temperature greater than or equal to 9. Nine. OK, and just like we did before, just verify with your eye, just compare to be sure that you're typing it in just as you see it in this window. And I'm satisfied with what I see here. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And you'll see down at the bottom of my mask manager now that it has provided a new mask for me. And it's called New Mask 89. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to rename this region of interest mask as ROI. And in the text here, that I um, doesn't have the tops and the bottom, the hat and the feet. So it's ROI underscore the number one. 
So in mine, I think I can just double click this, yeah, and rename it. I'm working with a Mac, so um, I have slightly different functions than if you're working with on a PC. So I go ahead and name that, and I've got ROI underscore one. And so what we want to do is, if you'll notice, if you look at the sea surface temperature layer now, you can see this region, uh, this region of interest, ROI, um, located here. And this includes temperatures that are between 9 and 13 degrees Celsius. So it's pretty cool water near shore, which I'm not surprised because of the runoff that you see and also um, cooling effects over shallow waters. But the Gulf of Mexico is very warm, and so that's why the waters are warmer offshore. So this blue to me has an okay contrast. You can choose whatever color contrast you'd like. On my um, example on page 20, I use this bright magenta. So let's just go ahead and try that. So let's practice changing the color. We're going to go with magenta here. Uh, the contrast is not so great. You'll notice that on page 20, the um, way that the sea surface temperature has, the color bar has been scaled, there's a lot more contrast from offshore dark red and black almost to near shore. Um, that, that can vary from persons, um, whoever, however you set up your color bar. So I haven't actually changed it here since I um, loaded this data layer, but if I wanted to make more of a contrast across the color range, I could, and it would just be a matter of adjusting the, the color here set from band data, for example, is how I did it. And so we covered that set from band data tool um, in part one, and that's all I did just now is to set the band data. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to this mask manager. Okay, so we're now on page 21, we're still on the statistics topic. Uh, we're just setting up where our mask is, the region of interest of where we want to um, look at the math or the statistics that we're gonna do on the data and compare that to the full scene. And so what you wanna do next is at the top of your window for CDAS, um, you're gonna see the Sigma icon. And that is the icon for the statistics tool. And as I hover over it, my tooltip will actually tell me, um, display statistics for selected bands. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna just click on the tool and it's gonna pop up this window that you see here. And nothing's been computed yet because I haven't actually chosen any bands. So if you see nothing, no statistics, that's totally normal. I would expect to see that. You can see this um, image right here on page 21. So on page 22, you're going to be making some choices of what you'd like to include in the statistics run. In this example, we're going to choose chlor A, sea surface temperature, ADG443 GIOP, and KD490. I note that when I mention these, I'm leaving, I'm not, I'm neglecting to include the reference and dependent um, naming on those files. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and scroll through here. I have to tell you a warning, using the statistics tool, you can get completely lost playing around with the statistics as I did when I was putting together this presentation. So sea surface temperature is already included there. And let's see, okay, we've got chord, and then we want ADG443, okay. Verify one, two, three, four. We've got four. Okay. Moving along to page 23, we're going to click this button here that says regional. Again, this may be a Windows PC thing. Um, it, this tab may look a little bit different for you. And we're going to leave the defaults as they are. You're going to click, click on quality. And you want to select this region of interest one mask you just created. So you're going to, you can either type it into search. I'm just pretty sure it's down at the bottom. Page 24, you're going to leave everything else the same here. You're going to click on criteria. And then click on fields. And you want to make sure to include the min max. And I'm pretty sure that is not the default because that's not showing up as a default for me. But everything else, just leave it as it is. Okay, so if you want, you can kind of review some of these other uh, tabs in this area. I'm going to leave everything else as default and look at quality again. Region, I'm leaving it alone. And bands. When you're satisfied with what you have here, go ahead and click run. And moving on to page 25 of the document. 
and I'm going to resize this statistics window. Okay. Move it around a little. Notice I'm collapsing this so I don't have to look at that so I can maximize my view area. And what I'd like for you to do, and I'm going to do it a little bit quietly here, is I just want you to use the scroll bars and to explore some of the data that have just come up. So use this scroll bar that's here along the right. And in the bottom, the statistics spreadsheet area that you see, um, it's a table at the bottom, um, to go ahead and scroll across in that region. Something I'd like for you to note is that you, for example, for chlorophyll, you have chlorophyll, and then you have chlorophyll ROI within the quality mask. Chlorophyll ROI is just the chlorophyll information that's contained within that region of interest that you just created. So the chlorophyll concentrations for those waters that are between 9 and 13 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to take a moment and just explore. So if you look down here in the statistics spreadsheet table near the bottom, you see the bands, first the full scene, and then the band that's just the ROI. When you look at valid pixels here, you can see the full scene is 84,731, but the ROI region is just represents 4989 pixels. And that makes sense because that ROI is smaller area. It's actually quite small compared to the total scene. Even with this smaller area, the ROI still actually represents a lot of information. So um, when you look at, let's see, say the ADG 443, we're going to look at it for, I'm going to resize, try to get a little bit more space here. When you look at it for the full scene and look at the x-axis and the y-axis range, the x-axis goes from 0.02 to 0.25. And the y-axis frequency distribution, you'd expect it to be high because we're looking at eight, over 84,000 pixels. Um, you see it extends pretty high up here. And then when you look at just the region of interest, this is the water that's near shore, most likely low salinity water that's influenced by the Suwannee River. Your frequency distribution, your frequency is going to be a lot less because we're dealing with fewer pixels. And now what I'd like for you to do is to focus your eye on the x-axis, the range of values that you see here. What do you see? It's quite a bit different than the full scene. In fact, it's really high, and it's 0.2 here to 1.5 in this range that you see here. So we're talking about the data that are like in this part of the full scene, blown up so that you can see it in this region. And that makes a lot of sense because this is cool water coming from shore. If you remember from the image, of that Landsat image that was stretched, admittedly, but you can see it's like this black water. And this indicates to us that it's very high in CDOM, or chlor um, colored dissolved organic matter, or chromophoric dissolved organic matter, depending on what part of the visible range you're looking at. And so you can see that these cool waters are high in CDOM. And so this is the type of frequency distribution that you might get of the water that's near shore. It's high in CDOM. But when you're looking at the full scene, then you start to see these offshore waters that are much lower in CDOM. And so that's why you have these pixels out here in the, in the much lower absorption by CDOM, because these are offshore waters that are not influenced by the Suwannee River. And so you have much higher frequency distribution of these warmer waters out in the Gulf, where either that CDOM has decomposed or broken down, been um, mineral, biomineralized by, um, or by bacteria, or it just never got there from the river.
And so that's why you see this difference in these histograms. And so I encourage you to go through and you look at it, and perhaps not for the sea surface temperature, but to look at the KD490, which is an estimate of particles, and also the chlorophyll concentration, um, and look at the different ranges of values that you might see there. And think about valid pixels and why you may get these different types of figures. For now, we're gonna ignore this percent threshold. What I'd like for you to do is to take some time and just understand the readings that you see here. Some of them are repeated down below, but the number of pixels in the scene, minimum, maximum, and um, mean. And um, in our choices for the statistics, we could have included median, I just chose not to, but you can uh, modify which data, result, data come out for here, and what results are presented to you. Okay, so we're gonna move along. And um, I've asked you a few questions and I've made a few notes on pages 27 and 28 about CDOM. Those may come in handy or you might see those sorts of questions again later. Um, what I'd like for you to do is if you've had a moment to look at the statistics uh, tool is to go ahead and close the statistics tool. And I just have to warn you, it's really easy to get lost in the statistics tool. Now we're going to use a different tool that's available. And this is the scatter plot tool and it's near statistics tool at the top of the bar for CDAS and it's the um, tool that I'm hovering over here uh, if, again remember you can hover over these tools and it'll provide a tool to display scatter plot for two selected bands so let's go ahead and click on that and resize the window that comes up again because you haven't selected anything it's going to appear uh, it's there's going to be nothing in the scene um, what we're going to do is we're going to choose um, some of the um, settings that I've applied here on page 29 is where I am. So you're going to use the ROI mask. And you want to make sure that you're going to use water D. Water D at the bottom. Um, and then what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to set sea surface temperature for the x-axis and ADG for the y-axis. And it appears that sea surface temperature has already been set for us for the x-axis. And for the y-axis, I'll go ahead and choose ADG, 443. OK. And then instead of hitting Run or OK, what it actually has you do is it has you click on this icon that's two little arrows, um, one point, tail pointing to the head um, at the top. And that's the Refresh view. And what this does is it provides for you a view of the scatter plot of what the data would look like one band or one data layer um, compared against the other. And on the X axis, you can see sea surface temperature. And on the Y axis, you see ADG. And this is just for all of the water area, not the ROI area. So as temperature increases, the ADG, P, the ADG um, also increases. Sorry. As temperature decreases, the ADG increases. And this makes sense because as we are looking at the cool river water coming in, we have higher CDOM concentrations in the cool water versus in the warmer waters that are the offshore waters. And this plot shows the relationship of temperature to light absorption by CDOM. And that relationship is because of this incoming river water. Uh, this is not just a standard relationship that you, if you had to exceed them offshore for some reason that's unrelated to a river input, there's no like inherent reason why CDOM would have, or low temperature water would have high CDOM um, if it's in an offshore water. We just know that this is a river system and that water has low temperature. You can play around with this a little bit more. Say you want to change the ROI mask to that ROI one, um, but we're not going to do that now. But I recommend giving, playing around with this scatter plot tool just to become familiar with it. So on page 30, number 22, we're going to close the scatter plot window. And we are moving along to page 31. All right, so I'm going to just clean up my space here before I move off of statistics and onto filter band. I'm going to go ahead and remove this pin, which we put in there. So I'll go ahead and highlight that and throw it in the trash. Yes. Close that. And I'm going to close this data layer, the sea surface temperature data layer. I hope you guys have a chance to explore that statistics tool a little bit more and these different um, features up here along the, the menu bar. Um, like I said, it can be a bit of a time sink, but it really can help you see some of the trends and patterns in your data. 
Okay, so we're going to move on to filter band. For filter band, we're really just going to talk about it a little bit, and I'll show you how to use the tool, but we're not going to spend a great deal of time exploring all of the different features of it. So um, it is one way to help define um, some of the features that you might see or patterns that you might see. It doesn't change the underlying data that you're originally using. However, it does give you an idea of, of some of the patterns that you see. This tool can be used to enhance features in an image. And CDES has a number of filter options. Um, and also, you can provide your own options, user supplied. Some of the options include filters to smooth and blur the image, adjust for stray light, detect lines and gradients, sharpen, enhance discontinuities, or apply a number of nonlinear and morphological filters. So we're now on page 32 of the um, exercise. And what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to click on the tool raster filtered band to open the create filtered band window. So this drop down menu here, you see filtered band. That's the one we're going to use. That opens create filtered band. OK. Let's see. And I'm going to actually cancel out of that one and first select the KD490 and go back, filtered band. OK, that's what I want to see. We're going to be working on the KD490 band for this, this part of the exercise. And we're going to try a few different band filter methods to get an understanding of what, how this, these sorts of filters modify the data. So in the example here in the image, I have highlighted arithmetic mean 3 by 3. Arithmetic mean right there. And I'm going to just leave the information here the same. I have band name. And I'm going to just leave it at one iteration. I'm going to click OK. And what that does is it's going to open this new data layer that you see here. It has the KD490, but it's appended um, some notation on it, AM3. I'm going to give it a mask. And I'm also um, oops, going to change the color bar, color scheme a little bit. Default, what do I want? I want KD. OK. So let's go ahead and go back and open the original KD. I'm going to reorder this just a bit. I can. Oop, I guess not. And I'm going to click. Here's the original KD. And here's the one with the arithmetic mean of 3 by 3, 3 by 3 pixel. Think of it that way. And you can see from the original data, I'm focusing my eye out here where you see some eddies and some filaments. And here's a filament here and some patterns in the water. And if you keep your eye focused on that area, you can see how it's blurred. And that is the effect of the filter. I encourage you to give it a try with some of these other filters. If you're curious, hey, which one do I want to use? Um, if you look at the image at the bottom of page 32, uh, we, when we, I created this image, I gave you the name of what filter I was using. So you can see the um, arithmetic mean 3 by 3. Another one that I'm going to give a try to is the high pass 3 by 3. So let's give that one a go. So raster filtered. OK. And I'm going to do the high pass 3 by 3. So let's high pass 3 by 3. Uh, I guess I'm going to do number 1 here. And you can see when I highlight the name, it actually shows you what the appended name is going to be down here for the band name. And I'm going to go ahead and click OK. Looking at the file manager, you can see these new data layers are being added down here. If I want to save those with my file, remember I'm going to have to save the file. I'm going to go ahead and apply a land mask. And my uh, color bar, I'm going to give it KD again so that matches the others. And if you just click through, here's the original. Here's the one we just did, this high pass filter. And now you can see it sharpens some of those features. So just for completion, I'm going to do this last one that I 
include on the images here, and it's the 2.5 pixel radius filter. Let's see, did I already pass it? Ah, here it is. And it's the mean. So mean 2.5 pixel radius, and I'll go ahead and click OK. And again, it's going to create this new one, and we're going to go ahead and give it the color, same color scheme, and apply the mask. And wow, is that blurry or what? So now you've got your high pass filter here, the original there, and then this arithmetic mean. These aren't too far off from each other. But it gives you an idea of being able to heighten or dampen the effects of some of the patterns that you see in the data. Again, your original KD490 data do not change, but these new data layers that have been created have been changed. So just be aware of that when you're working with your data. Okay, so we're gonna move along to page 33. What I'd like for you to do now is to declutter the space a little bit. I'm gonna close these data layers that we've just been looking at from the filter. And we're now starting page 33 at pixel extraction. So everything else is closed, okay, it's pretty cleaned up. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and double click on the chlorophyll A data layer. There you see it there. And this time we're gonna use the pin tool, we're just gonna drop it into the scene. I'm not gonna be particularly um, careful about where I put it like I did the last time. So I'm just gonna choose this pin tool. I'm gonna just drop it in the scene, and it looks like here I've tried to drop it a little bit closer. Notice my color range across the range here is not as you see in the image, um, and that's partly because I just haven't done anything to the color band. So I'm gonna put the, the pin there. I'm gonna go ahead and go back over to the color manager. I'm gonna set band data, set from band data, and it should at least a little bit more closely resemble the image that you see there. Okay, so I've dropped my pin. My scene at the bottom of page 33 looks about like what I'm showing you guys here. And now what I'd like to do is I'd like to launch the pixel extraction tool. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go across the top of CDAS to tools at the top. I'm going to um, click on it and I'm going to choose pixel extraction. This opens this new window that you see here. It's the pixel extraction window. And on the input output tab, I'm going to update the entries for the output directory. So I have here's my source. And for my output directory, I want to make sure I'm putting it in the correct location. And uh, I think I'm going to actually um, click on that because I want to put it a little bit deeper. Um, in the file that you guys here have here, it just says CDAS Advanced Skills. I've made a choice to add this additional folder layer. OK. I'm going on to page 35. The parameters tab within this pixel extraction window. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. <clears throat> and I'm going to change the window size to a three by three box. So see here where it says window size, right now it says one by one. I'm going to click that to be three. And so that's going to be a three by three box. And then I'm going to choose the pixel value aggregation method. And in this case, I'm going to choose mean. I'm going to deselect tie point grids. And I'm going to deselect masks. So I'm, what I'm going to do is, yeah, your, um, your pin location isn't going to exactly match what's in the image here, but I just want to verify that my image matches what I have on my screen here. So I'll move that out of the way. And mm, I'm satisfied. And I'll go ahead and also check export output coordinates to Google Earth KMZ. Okay, when I'm satisfied with what I have here, I'm gonna go ahead and click Extract. And this gives me a notice, Pixel Extraction Tool has run successfully and written the result to my folder. And if I wanted to look at where that is, I can see that, yes, in fact, I have these new files, PixX, um, which is what the file naming was on that input output. For ease of use, you may want to actually give it a file prefix that's meaningful. I was just using the default in that case. So 
So I'm now on page 36. I'm going to go ahead and close this. The um, extraction effort that you just went through produced an output text file, which you may want to open using some spreadsheet software. Um, and the example only shows pixel extraction using the pin. I'm not using other methods for this. So um, what I'm going to do is you see here that um, I have this text file. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to open up the, um, the pixel information that I just um, captured with pixel extraction using my uh, spreadsheet software. So the file that I'm interested in looking at is this PixX co-located measurements. And I'm going to just go ahead and right click and open with my spreadsheet software. And you can see here it's a little bit messy because of the way that it displays the data. So um, I'm not going to belabor it here, but what I'd like to point out is you may want to rearrange some of the data a little bit so that you can uh, display it in a way that's a little bit more meaningful. And you can see that on page 36 on the right-hand side image, I show where I've just reoriented, I've transposed the data, copied and pasted it um, to give you the information of the product ID, uh, the coordinates, where the pin was located, what the latitude and longitude were, and then it gives you information for what the values were at that pixel. And so here it provides information about all of the data. So all of the data layers that were included in this file, I see the mean, the sigma, the number of pixels that were used to calculate it. And nine makes sense because I was looking at a three by three box. So three times three gives me a box of nine pixels. And so I can see these mean values for these different data layers in the file. And while I'm not going to transpose the data here, you can see that this information is repeated here, that I'm just looking at um, the same information, the remote sensing reflectance, and then it's going to continue on and it's going to go through different data um, layers that are present in this file, including the chlorophyll. Okay, so I recommend going through and doing the transpose on this spreadsheet file because you might be interested in looking at that data later. And then just close the file, save it and close it when you're done. So that's how you do a pixel extraction. It's pretty straightforward. Um, it's a very useful tool to have. Oftentimes the analysis that I do for pixel extraction, I do outside of um, CDAS. Um, but as you've learned, it's possible to use information that you can grab from pixels and compare it within um, CDAS. So, um, but most of the work I do with the pixel information, I extract and use it in a spreadsheet. Okay, so I'm going to go back to CDAS and I'm going to um, close this data layer here. And I've made some changes to this file because I did that filtering. And I'm going to go ahead and just save it and just overwrite the, the file name. Save that. Okay, yes, I know it already exists and I'm planning to overwrite it. Great. And now that I'm done with this file, I'm going to go ahead and close it. So the data that we're going to use to show the example of combining or mosaicing two images comes from a different part of the world. And it comes from the Salish Sea region, which is in uh, northwest Washington state and southwest um, British Columbia, Canada. And um, it's a region that's very important in terms of salmon fisheries. There are many tribal organizations that live there, and the Salish people are very proud um, people of their environment because it's well monitored, it's well taken care of, and it serves the people and they serve the land and the sea. And so the two images that we're going to be working on together to combine um, horizontally or ge geometrically, we're going to combine them, are from this region of the world. And so we've provided data for you on our website, and it's in my folder here, I've called it Salish Sea. And you should have two files. Um, two images composed of four files. You have one image of uh, .dim and uh, .data for a particular timestamp um, uh, in 2018. And then you have another image of the same day, but a slightly different timestamp because it was the image that was collected um, just uh, before this first image. So we have the image 13, um, 000 was collected just before 13500. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to take these two images and um, combine them or mosaic them. So what you need to do is you want, need to go ahead and um, go to your folder that contains the Salish C data and open the .dim files. 
So we're going to go back to CDAS, so and we're going to open these files. So we're going to navigate to a new location, Salish Sea, as I already pointed out. And these files are sea surface temperature that we're going to be combining. But you could do this with the other data, of course. So we've collected these. And if you click on rasters, well, we do actually, these are combined. Um, what we want to do is we want to open the sea surface temperature data for the um, for one of the files and then click on rasters and open the sea surface temperature data for the other file. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to apply land masks to these just so that you can really get a feel for the data. I'm going to change my color of my land mask to black. And remember, these are different files. Um, so we're going to apply the land mask to this one as well. And if you toggle between these two data layers that you have listed here, or open here now, we have sea surface temperature for the more northern region where you see Canada and parts of Alaska. These are reprojected files. And then you see sea surface temperature for the southern part of the region, which you see most of the west coast of the United States, some of Canada, and some of Mexico. And so what we want to do is we want to combine these along that northern edge of this image that you see displayed here, or the southern edge of this image, in a meaningful way and respecting the, the what may need to be done mathematically to the pixels to combine the two of them. Okay, so you've got these two files open. You see in this image on page 37, the, um, I've changed the, band co the color of the land mask, but you see both of these open, and I've tiled them horizontally, or excuse me, vertically. Let's unsynchronize them in this case. Okay, so you can see them both here. There are reprojected co-located files of the region that includes ocean color and sea surface temperature. So as you saw when I first opened these rasters, it's more than just sea surface temperature, but we're just gonna be working on the sea surface temperature data. Or at least we're only gonna be viewing the sea surface temperature data in this example. So looking at page 38, what we wanna do is we wanna find the mosaic tool. And I love how it, intuitive this icon is for this tool. It just looks like a bunch of images or pieces of paper overlying each other. And that's exactly the effort that you're going to be doing. You're going to be lining them up on the margins where they overlap. And mathematically, they're going to be combined in a way that's meaningful and still retains the data. So we're going to go ahead and collect, click on mosaic, and it's going to create, open up a create mosaic file. And you see the image of this file located on the right of page 38. And what we want to do is we want to click on this plus sign that we see here under source files to add the source files, which are these two files that are open here. So go ahead and click on that one. And we want to make sure that we are in the correct location. So we're in the advanced, CDAS advanced, Salish C folder. And I'm going to choose these DIM files of what we want to select. Okay. And you see them added here. And the path that you see in the image on page 38 will be slightly different because remember, I changed some of the um, naming convention on this um, for the, the folders. <clears throat> so for the output file, we want to give it something a little bit more meaningful than just mosaic. Um, what I'm going to do is um, just going to give it a meaningful name that we can find later. So I'm going to give it this new output name and I'll give it something so that we know what we're looking at. Okay, and we want to put it in the correct output directory. Don't be fooled, put it in the correct place. And we're going to have it open in CDAS when we're done. So moving on to page 39, we're going to click on the map projections definition. And uh, what we want to do is see where it says mosaic bounds. We want to edit the mosaic bounds to subset the mosaic image to the region of interest. So we're going to actually move it over here to where this image actually is located. 
and um, I'm going to use the image that's on the far right of page 39 to actually type in um, to more clearly what the bounds are. So you can see here as I follow it, as I do it, just go ahead and follow along with me. I'm going to do negative 127 and negative 120. Fifty two and forty seven. And you can see as I'm making these edits, this little red box in the map is um, getting smaller and, and focusing in on that region. So as you see, I have manually changed the um, dimensions here, the boundaries, the west, um, east, north, and south. And a key point that I just want to point out here is you um, also need to change the pixel size. And so we're working with modus data in this example. And so just as your image on page 39 on the far right shows, we're going to change this to 0.02. So your map projection definitions are done. We're going to move on to variables and conditions. If you go to variables and hover, your tooltip here will say choose the bands to process. We want to go ahead and click on that. And this will open the band chooser window. Here we want to select bands of interest. And if we wanted to, we could just select all. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to select a subset of the data. I'm going to select all of the RRSs, chlorophyll A, sea surface temperature, KD490. I'm also going to choose the latitude, longitudes, and the L2 flags. So I'll go ahead and do that now. And I'll scroll back up and I'll just verify that I've got everything that I wanted to select, both latitude and longitude, D and R, L2 flags, and then these data products. So I'll go ahead and click OK. <clears throat> so I'll go back and look at this variables and conditions window. I'm still on, um, I'm now on page 40. I'm still looking at the variables and conditions. And now what I'd like to do is I'd like to click on the plus sign in variables and conditions. It's added this new variable here. It's just called variable 19. I want to rename this and I'm going to rename it land. And if I click here, so that's under name, under expression, you'll see to the far right, these ellipses. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And I want to define what land is going to be, which band. And so I'm going to go ahead and it's not actually going to be one of the bands in the list here under rasters. It's going to be one of the flags. So I'll click on show single flags and I'll unclick under masks and bands. And the flag that this is, is going to be L2 flags are land. You can see it here in the expression editor. So I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm satisfied with that. I'm going to click OK. I'm satisfied with this listing here. I'm not going to change anything more. I'm happy with my map projection. It's in the location and of the pixel size I want. And it's the output name and also location of interest. And then I'm going to click Run. Once it has finished running, you're going to go ahead and confirm that it has run and close this Create Mosaic file. And you'll notice over here in the file manager that it has um, dropped a new file there and it has this appended name mosaic on it. We're going to click on this rasters caret here or the little triangle and open up the chlorophyll layer. You can see here that there, um, the chlorophyll layer is there, but it may be kind of hard to identify exactly where we're talking about. So we need to add a land mask. But in this case, we actually need to create the land mask. Click on the mask manager and you'll notice here that it's empty. The expression editor for the mask manager, it's important, the mask manager editor. What we're going to do is we're going to manually add back in this mask. Remember, in the last steps, you actually created a variable called land. And so if we click on show bands, we'll see land here, click on it, and it's added to the expression editor. Go ahead and click OK. And you can see that it has added the um, 
the mask is added here. And you can see that this is the northwest part of Washington state and the southwest part of British Columbia. And this is the Salish Sea region. And so if we were to zoom in into this region, if you're familiar with Seattle, the Seattle area is down in this region here. Um, the pixel size is pretty coarse, but it's modus, so that's expected. But now we have this land mask that's been added back into it. <clears throat> We're going to go to Layer Manager. And we can see again, click it on and click it off, this new mask. The Mask Manager, ah, we need to remember to rename it. So we'll rename it Land so it's meaningful to us. And over in the Layer Manager, it should be listed here as Land. So we're going to go back to the file manager and notice it's our stack of pancakes with the red sauce so that means it needs to be saved and what we want to do is we want to right click on this new mosaic and click save as and we're just going to save it as the same name and overwrite it yes we want to overwrite it we want to preserve that land mask that we just added all right so we're going to close the files that we were working with before those. Yes, we're going to go ahead and close it without those changes. Those are the two that we worked with, the original two, yes. And then we have this new um, file that we just created. So now you know how to create a mosaic. So congratulations. This marks the end of exercise three, advanced skills in CDAF. And thank you again for sticking with us. And it's been great. Thank you. Now we will be going quiet for a while so that you may work on your exercises. Please type in your questions in the webinar software. Periodically, we will unmute our audio and answer the questions that are coming in. All right, so as I said just a moment ago, we're gonna have this quiet laboratory time. Uh, just wanna remind you, welcome and thank you uh, for being a part of this uh, webinar series. We're really excited to have you. Uh, we're going to have a period of time going forward where we're going to be very quiet. We'll be taking your questions. Please keep submitting your questions through the webinar software. Um, we are getting those and we're aggregating them into um, a document and we'll from time to time come on and we'll answer them. And if needed, we'll get on and we'll um, uh, show you those questions and answers or also just demonstrate some of the material. A number of people have asked us if we can change the due date on the homeworks, and we enthusiastically have said yes. Thank you, Brock, for updating the uh, webinar uh, website, the course website. The new due date is going to be July 5th. So we know a number of you were um, concerned about that, and we've heard you. So we've changed the due date to July 5th. Um, so uh, before we before I move on again, I just want to say thank you very much for participating in this. Thank you again to Dr. Daniela Gerlin, who participated with us in part two and has been listening in today from the Department of Natural Resources in Wisconsin. So uh, let's start with uh, question one. This is for the in situ data that you put in uh, CBAS format. The original file was in Excel format. And this question that came up write down the units of chlorophyll A, this was for in situ data. And we already talked during the demo that uh, CDAS expects chlorophyll concentration units to be in milligrams per meter cube, whereas in situ data we have are in micrograms per liter. And so this is just to point your attention or draw your attention to the fact that they, they, are, diff they are the same units. When you convert microgram per liter, they, they are equivalent to uh, milligram per meter cube. And this is just for you to note that actually they are, they are same units, but expressed differently. And so that's why this question was there. That is for question one. Question two came up when we fit the line to the data between uh, remote sensing and in situ data, the, the line fit has correlation coefficient with it. And we changed the box size and saw how correlation coefficient changed. So what is 
uh, acceptable value? And that's a good question. And that actually depends on the size of your sample, not only size of the samples, but how independent they are, how autocorrelated they are. So based on that, uh, if you have enough number of points, then you can perform standard statistical significance tests, such as t-test for correlation coefficients. And then you can say that this, this number is significant by 95% or 98%. You can choose the confidence, and then that would be your test, that whatever number you give, okay, it's significant at this level. But we have no way of doing it because all we had was six points. This was more for demonstration how you can do it. So um, if you have more points, you can uh, do the significance test on your correlation coefficient. Uh, so is there a guideline for collecting in situ data for calibration and verification of algorithm? How would one collect samples that somehow compares to image pixel resolution? So um, here there is, um, Sherry, I think you have provided the answer here. And if you want to address that question. Okay. Um, so there's a large body of work on collecting in situ data for calibration and validation in the ocean optics community and the ocean color web website that we pointed you to. And I think it's in the list of resources that Brock put together. Um, we talked about this. It's also the same one where that overpass predictor um, was. Um, it has a documentations page. If you just go to the main web page, then go to docs, technical documents. And in that technical documents provides a lot of information on how NASA, and this is from the NASA perspective, how it goes about collecting information and developing algorithms and doing CalVal. And so it's a lot of information. I know it's kind of like throwing a, a great deal of information at you, but I think that to fully address it, it would be wise to look at some of those technical documents. Um, so that addresses the question about CalVal. Um, the second question on how would one collect samples that somehow compare to image pixel resolutions, um, I, I may need to draw on Daniela and with Anita on this a little bit more. Um, the, in the community, what we normally do in practice is uh, we collect imagery, we collect ground truth data, and then we average a num certain number of pixels around where that ground truth was located. And so typically in my part of the aquatic remote sensing world, it's a three by three pixel around that point. Um, as part of the exercise that you're working on, we actually have you think about that and look at that and how that box size, what box size you're gonna choose around that pixel. And so some of these questions get at some more fundamental questions related to remote sensing and scaling and statistically evaluating what is the best um, box or number of pixels around the ground truth to use. What's the, the best decision that you can make? Um, and I'm curious of Amita and Danielle, and I'm not sure if you are able to do audio enable, if either of you would like to add a little bit more information about, um, about the um, comparing the pixel to the um, ground truth. Uh, yes, I, 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 sorry. Okay, and this is Daniela. I also use a three times three pixel window for the Landsat data, so we're looking at 90 times 90 meters there. And we normally um, write down a set of coordinates where we plan to collect data where our station is, and then we additionally take track of the um, actual coordinates in the field, and our GPS is typically accurate within f about five meters. And while we collect data, we actually drift a little. So we are pretty much in the center of this area, but we might drift a little all over the place. So nine, three times three pixels will give us a signal that is about comparable to our field measurements. And additionally, I think Dr. Wesley Moses, um, I think he works with the Neville Research Lab. He has yeah. done a lot of research with, in terms of in, pixel spatial variability. So this might be an issue if you look at larger pixel sizes like 300 times 300 meters or 1,000 times 1,000 meters. So you will have to find the strategy to actually uh, match your field measurements across the pixel. So for mm -hmm. ZL2 and Landsat, it's quite easy. Do you happen to know when he published that paper? Because I'll try to find the link and put it into the... Um, I can't question. remember. He presented something at the last Ocean Sciences meeting in okay. Oregon and Portland the last time. Okay. 
Okay, I'll do a search for it and see if I can add the, the um, citation to this. Thank you. Okay, I think that would be really useful. Also, Daniela, you mentioned that uh, you can combine images and field data for different dates to increase the number of points for correlation. Can you explain that a little bit? So if you atmospherically correct your images, then um, they should be all comparable to each other. So you could have images from maybe five to six days together with field data collected on the same five and six days, which was collected closely to the image acquisition time. Mm -hmm. And then you could combine all these data sets and develop a single regression to develop your model. Yes, so across time, across different times. Yes. Once and okay. that's if the atmospheric correction works. Yes, great. And then Amita, do you want to save some of these questions for later or do you want to continue on for one or two more? Um, let's see. I, I just wanted to go to the last, it's not a question, but I saw this in one of the um, attendees comments that uh, OCSSW, when they try to load this mtl.txt file, uh, got this warning that file is not valid input mission and mission is null. This, um, if you check the form, um, this has come up again and again. And then one thing that we found was that either you have to reinstall your OCSSW for that particular sensor that you are trying to um, use the OCSSW, or sometimes you may just have to reinstall CDAS. That was suggested and that worked for me. This happened for me too. And I had to reinstall CDAS and then everything started working again. So something gets overwritten or some Java issue comes up and this happens. So um, this not sure what the reason is, but if you reinstall CDAS and it doesn't take long, then you will get rid of this warning and you'll be able to process the data. Okay. It could be a version issue as Daniela says, Yes, I would um, want to, this Neela, I would want to add just to make sure to install the latest version of CDAS. Ah, yes. Okay. And the previous versions can't read in the Landsat 8 Collection 1 data. Okay, I'm trying to capture this. This will put it, okay. Great. And then, um, how do you guys feel about going into the quiet laboratory time now and um, having our participants work on that? and in a few minutes, maybe 10 minutes or so, uh, we'll get back online and just check in with folks. How does that sound? So if, you're, if you have any questions, you can type in the chat box, we are here, we are monitoring, and uh, we will be able to help with, if you're working with the exercises and if you need any help or if you have any questions, uh, just chat, uh, type them in the chat box and we'll address them. But Great. next hour, half or so, you can uh, just work on the exercises and get experience. And if you have any difficulties, we can help during that time. All right, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and go into mute and we look forward to seeing your questions come in. And again, thank you, Dr. Gerland, for getting on and helping us. Hello again, this is Sherry, just getting on. Um, I just wanna address some of the questions that have come on. Um, also just wanna remind you guys that we are in our laboratory, um, uh, quiet laboratory time. I know I'm not being quiet at the moment, but um, we're in our quiet laboratory time for you to work on your um, exercises and submit questions to us and we'll do our best to answer the questions. Um, we are furiously um, answering them ourselves and researching the answers. So um, we'll get to them when we can. We may not get them to them exactly in the right order. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, Brock and the team put together these question and answer sessions and put them up online um, and they're available to you after the seminar, after the webinar series. So for example, like in question three, um, I have a, my assignment is to look for this paper and we'll put the citation in there when I can find it if it's available.
So I'm going to go ahead and um, walk through a couple of the answers here um, and uh, to some of the questions that we've got. And I'm not going to do all of them in exactly the same order, um, but I'll go ahead and um, address, I'm going to hit number four first, is how do you make the in-situ text file that Amita walked you through with the, um, the Wisconsin data? We had you make it manually. Yes, you can do it that way. Um, also, if you want to automate your process, um, you can start to create these files and um, in uh, programs like MATLAB or uh, in scripting languages, um, and you can like use Python or R, whatever you're most comfortable with, um, to build these text files and to output them. And so it's a nice automated way to work with the data. Um, I know that Daniela has talked a number of times of using CDAS for some things, pulling the data out, and then running other processes in um, by uh, writing up the code herself outside of CDAS. This is really common in the aquatic remote sensing community. So yes, manually, but you can also build methods to um, create these scripts automatically or to create these um, text files. You need to test, you know, good software practices. So make sure to build unit tests and to test your data to see if you're getting the output you'd anticipate. Um, number six here, uh, why might the crop command be grayed out? And this actually was an example of one of our participants debugged it himself and gave me back the answer. And that is he, when he was using it, the crop tool was not working and it was because he didn't have the raster loaded into the viewer. So if that happened to you, um, that's the solution that we had there. Um, and number seven, uh -huh. Amita? If I, can, if I can just add something to answer six, uh, this sure. is true for loading in situ data as well. When you, if you want to have in situ file from like CBAS format in, you have to have your image raster loaded first, only then it would put the in situ data uh, on top of the image. Oh, okay. Oh, great. You will not able to see the in situ data. Okay, thank you. Um, one of our participants asked why we might want to use this beam uh, to map format instead of TIFF or an IMG. We were doing this format for the purposes of this webinar series because we, were, we knew we were going to be working with everything in CDAS. Um, but if you wanted to make your image more portable, you might want to consider outputting it to something like TIFF so you could use it in QGIS or ArcGIS. Okay, so um, I'm going to move on to question eight. Are there any other open source software um, packages available that are similar to CDAS? And the, the one that comes to mind um, for me, and although I have it installed, um, I don't actually use it myself, and that's Snap. And um, I've provided the website here. When you are able to access the um, question and answer page, you'll be able to use this link from there. Um, but if you just did a search on um, ESA for European Space Agency SNAP, this will be your top link. And it's used for the Sentinel um, series of sensors. It's built by the same consulting firm that did the most recent update of CDAS in about 2013 or so. And so its user interface is very similar. Dr. Gerlin has used it, and she provided some helpful input here. And um, what it is is that there are some video tutorials for the installation of ESA SNAP. And um, while those tutorials may be a little bit outdated, they're still quite useful. So if you're interested in working, especially if you're interested in working with the Sentinel data, um, and now that you're familiar with how CDAS looks and feels, it's going to be a very similar type of environment with SNAP. Um, there are other. Uh, open source software packages that are out there. In fact, our set has done some training on um, using QGIS, QGIS, and I've provided the link there as well. Um, this one's great because it has all of that functionality that you've come to learn to appreciate with a, a not for a proprietary software like ArcGIS, but it's in an open source format of QGIS. QGIS doesn't have nearly the, the, um, the amount of uh, functionality that you might have for CDAS for remote sensing, uh, especially aquatic remote sensing, but it still can handle images and can get, still get pretty far, and it's open source. I've used it a little bit, but I'm not an expert at it. I don't have the list of RSET trainings here that have used QGIS. Maybe that would be a sherry task, is to find some links of RSET trainings. And for QGIS, you mean specifically for watch quality, or? Uh, no, just generally for so that people could get used to using it. Um, go back and check. Um, I can let me find the link and I'll post some where we did QGIS. That would be great. And I'll I'll assign that to both of us. How's that sound? Oops. 
I can't spell today <laughs> or type. Um, okay, so what was the other question I was going to address? 10. Uh, I'm going to slide down. We're still working on question 9. We really appreciate the question that came in about multiple days, but we're still working on the answer to that one for you. Some people have had some problems with CDAS issues and working or in processing Landsat data. Amita, I'm going to go through the answers that I put here, but you're the one who's really been working a lot with Landsat data, so please add value to whatever it is that I have listed here. Um, some input that we got from Daniela was to make sure that you're always using the most up-to-date version of CDAS. The functionality of Landsat is a relatively new feature in the last couple of years, and they're constantly improving it, and it's really come a long way, and it's exciting what they've done with it. Um, so uh, make sure that you're using the most recent version of CDAS. If the problem that you're having is just a problem with OCC SSW processors, but you know that you're on Linux or a Mac or Unix and it, that it should work, sometimes reinstalling the OCSSW processor from the menu bar and just using LOI and doing the clean install can help. I ran into that problem. Amita mentioned earlier today that if that doesn't work, sometimes uninstalling and reinstalling CDAS can help. And then for this problem that we're working on, just make sure that you're using the correct data um, for that, which was the Landsat 8 OLI TIRS C2, or excuse me, C1, collection one, level one data um, downloaded from the Earth Explorer website. And I'll stop talking, Amita, if you want to add anything to, to that. So uh, in, in CDAS, uh, when the installation, and I'm trying to find the link where you go to, there's a information about requirement for installation. So I think the, like, um, or the supporting softwares, just Java and Python, and you know they have to be um, in certain certain locations, certain version. I think so. It, a number of things can go wrong, and then CDAS won't work. So um, it, that's why CDAS form, although it is sometimes slow, it usually works. They do come back with uh, answers. So you have to register, I think, and log in to post questions in the forum, but we highly recommend that you do that, and I'm going to post the link. Awesome, thank you. So this is just installation tutorial, and you probably already have seen it, but if you go to the site, it also has a requirement, and our introductory webinar, or last year, what the water quality webinar we did, had a list of things that you should be checking um, for installing CEDA, so that, um, you can see different for different uh, systems. It it talks about how to download and install. And okay. Check what the requirements are. Okay, for great. So this is what you're describing here. What's listed in the view, Anita, of creating the CDAS environment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that should be what you guys are looking for when you're examining this. So. If you already have CDAS installed, you're probably familiar with this, but we advise you to go back and to review that. Okay, if you're ready, I'm going to go ahead and move on to number 11. Anita, is that okay? I'm going to post a link for the QGIS analysis. Oh, okay, oh great. Yeah, that website, the Ocean Color Web website, has so much information. Um, it's really useful in terms of the documentation and the they have access to the data. <clears throat> so here is the well, here is one webinar where there was detailed QGIS analysis and also has a link on how to install QGIS if you don't have it and some of the features that you can use. So I'm just posting this link um, in question eight. Okay. Okay, great. So about question nine, although we are checking, it says uh, how CDAS handles NAN and auto number data. Um, when you're averaging, I believe that it should ignore NAN, but I want to make sure, and obviously you said that it doesn't change the result or doesn't show right results. So we will be checking that and we'll let you know. We'll post it online so that you can, you can have the correct answer for that. Right, great. 
Um, on question 11, a question came in about the, in the view on the um, page 37 of the document that we had, uh, why the lower image looks so skewed. These are both projected using the same map projection. And just a note, this, um, the lower image here on page 37 is a very high latitude. And so to our eye, it might look skewed partly because of the related to the map projection that you're seeing. Um, so um, the answer there is that may be why it's appearing skewed. The question came in, number 13 here, do we have to send you the data that we process during the course in order to get the certificate or just complete the homework one and three provided in Google Forms? You do not need to send the data. Please don't send us the data. <laughs> um, you'll notice that at the top of the question and answer, you have the email addresses for Amita and me. Feel free to ask us questions. We will try to answer them in a timely way, um, but please don't send us the data there. We just need you to fill out the answers to part one and three um, Google Forms. And just as a reminder, those are due, the new due date is July 5th. Also in uh, answer to question 10, I just added a link to the forum that uh, you can log in and post your uh, questions in there. Okay, so uh, Mita, unless you wanna address some of these questions that we're still answering now, or if you wanna hold, um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask people to um, just continue sending us questions through the question and uh, we'll, we're getting them, we're hearing them, we're just being quiet. Yes, so I think, yeah, when we can come back and talk about the rest of the questions so they have some chance to work on exercises. Okay, great. So it's about seven minutes after the hour now. Um, what do you say, Amita, in about 20, 25 minutes, get back on? That sounds good, yes. Okay, great. So mm -hmm. you'll hear from us again and uh, enjoy working on the exercises. Okay, so we're back. And um, this is gonna be the last time that we're gonna get on the audio and go through um, some of the questions that have come in. Uh, my co-instructor, Amita, is standing by. Uh, we're gonna address uh, questions um, 14 through uh, 19 um, in the document. And just as a reminder, this document will be available online and we will be continuing to add some depth to the answers. So um, this document may change a little bit before uh, what you see here in this um, recording and also what you see and what ends up online. Um, so a question came in about the character number limit on the length of the name of the file. Um, so the path of the whole directory structure and the file name in CDAS. Um, also our space characters allowed underscore or dash accepted. Um, and the answer to that is that spaces are generally not a good idea. We don't recommend having spaces in your file names, um, especially using Unix or Linux systems. Uh, it tends to choke on that. And we've all made this mistake. I've made it many times before. Um, try to avoid having spaces. Um, don't have them. Um, we recommend instead like an underscore. Dashes are also okay. Um, in previous versions of CDAS, there was a major update in um, right around the 2013 timeframe in the um, in CDAS in terms of its structure and also the user interface. And before that, the path length and file um, the character limit there was a character limit. And so in earlier instructions I gave you guys, I um, suggested that you keep the files not too deep. And it partly is because of the legacy of my use with CDAS um, is that it did matter then. Since that changeover um, in 2013 or so, I have not had problems with path length with this. Um, I haven't encountered them. It doesn't mean that they won't happen. It's just that I have not encountered them like they were in the past. So um, we haven't encountered them, um, but definitely don't have the spaces in there. A questioner asked, this is number 15, they were on page seven of the advanced skills of CDAS document. Um, and if you are able to flip to it, um, here, the person was asking um, that if they could use a different file for their reference file. And the image you see here on the right gives you the window for the create co-located file. Yes, you can use a different um, file in this example. Uh, we just happened to use this one and we also kept a lot of the defaults in place. 
you can use a different reference file. You can change the output file name to, instead of being what it is here. Um, you can also change the naming of the target file bands. Um, it can get really confusing, and like the example we did, where we have multiple rounds of doing this co-location, where you have R dash underscore R underscore D. You can make changes to that, so it's more meaningful to you. I recommend it being as meaningful as possible. Question 16 came in, and the question was, um, would in-situ validation of index values, and this is the color index or the cyanobacterial index, be validated in the same way, so in this correlation or regression approach, as in the demonstrations? And what we'd like to comment on is, in terms of like what's the conceptual approach to doing this validation of like an x versus y axis that's how yeah that's how you would do it is you would compare these results either a t test or a regression correlation the problem with this though is if you're trying to do the cyanobacteria index on landsat data for example um, it may not have the spectral resolution that you need to actually make that computation so you might be able to capture that information using a modus sensor for example but it you won't be able to calculate it using some of the other sensors that don't have the spectral resolution to capture that daniela helped us with the answer to this question so i want to thank her for stepping in to give us a little help on that um, Let's see. So another way that you can do validation is um, when you do atmospherically corrected data is um, to look at CDAS and to look at the actual reflectance values. So instead of coming to product like a cyanobacteria index, to instead look at what's the reflectance value at that particular wavelength. Again, this has some considerations because you're dealing with, um, if you have a sensor where you're measuring um, reflectance from the surface, you need to downscale it so it's got the same full width half max as the bands that you'd be using for like a Landsat sensor. So your apples to apples comparison, but it is possible to do that comparison so long as you're using an atmospherically corrected data product. Um, so moving along to question 17. Um, is there any way to make a year's average of MODIS sea surface temperature contour graph in CDAS from separate um, .nc files? Or should the person make a new NC file with the average value in the cells of interest and then plot the contour graph? Um, we had a couple of answers on this one, and I think what the real answer is to this questioner is that we're going to provide some examples of ideas that we have for things that you could pursue. Uh, we may not have the final answer for this one. Um, it can be done in QGIS, um, add rasters from different NC files and do the raster calculation to average them. Thank you, Amita, for providing that answer. Uh, the average data can be added as a raster and draw display contours or color field map. If what you're trying to do is to perform a time series analysis in CDAS, uh, we recommend that the questioner review the CDAS help section on time series analysis. Just like you had these statistics tools across the top of the CDAS page, there are time series analysis tools as well. I'm not sure if this gets at the answer that the questioner is um, seeking, but we wanted to point out that there are these time series tools that we did not review in, in any of the exercises that we talked about today. A lot of the exercises that we've worked on for, as part of this webinar series were informed by some of the examples that were provided by the CDAS team. We repackaged them and changed them around a little bit. Um, they had a series of video tutorials that came out in, I think it was about 2015. And in the question and answer, we provide the link to those video tutorials. And one of those had a case study. It was kind of long. And what's nice on the website, they break it down by timestamp so you can see what skill they're addressing at particular timestamps. Um, but what they did is they did a sea surface temperature anomaly calculation using data that they just grabbed from the um, level three browser off of the Ocean Color web, um, website, but it gives you an idea of how to do some of this math. So if the questioner is asking, how do I get at some of these skills, this video tutorial may address it. If the questioner is getting at specifically, how do I deal with certain file types, this may not address that. Amita, I'm gonna just ask a real quick question here if you wanted to interrupt me and put any comments in and the things that I've talked about so far. Well, I think uh, your answer is right on point, so um, I don't have anything to add at this point. Okay, great. And Danielle, I just got your point on question 19, so thank you. Um, feel free to add that to the document if you'd like. Um, Amita, I'm going to ask you to do 18 because I think you're the one who answered that and you're more familiar with it. Oh yeah, so 18 is, um, can you check the signals against some sort of 
spill on land. And it's in terms of spill of highly saline water on land. Um, so optical data have been used. If it's not cloudy, uh, you can detect if previously dry land, when it has water on it, reflectance changes. And if you can detect that, then you can see the water on dry land. And so this has been routinely done by using MODIS data. There's a link provided here. It, it talks about, it shows, uh, I think band two and seven are used for sure to, to detect flooding over dry land. So you can try using MODIS reflectance data and see uh, if you can, can detect saline water on land. Okay. So, uh, um, it's crucial that whatever spill you see on land changes reflectance of that surface and then you can detect it. All right. Um, so then we're now down to our last question, which is question 19. Thank you, Daniela, so much for helping us out here. Um, there was a comment that came in. This is related to a previous comment um, about spaces. So um, the questioner ask, asked, um, that they were receiving this particular file warning, the mission equals null, um, not a valid input, mission mission equals null. And this might be related to the issue with the space in the, in the path or file name. So check the file name in the path. Um, if that does not work, um, you may want to reinstall OCSSW um, and then restart CDAS. And then if that does not work, you may want to consider reinstalling CDAS and just make sure you have the most recent version of CDAS. So I think that this addresses all of the questions that we're going to be able to answer in this series, in this session. Um, we have received many comments from participants loud and clear, and we are going to be providing some input to the CDAS team about the functionality of their, um, their client um, configuration. So we will pass along those comments to them, and we thank you for your feedback. We also thank you for your participation in this webinar series. Please make sure to fill out that survey because it informs us of what our participants want to learn so that we can design appropriate um, webinar series in the future that meet the needs of the community. Amita, would you like to add anything? No, I think this is fine. So we will be reviewing some of the questions again and if we can provide any additional information, especially question nine here where uh, adding clusters with NANs, how is that dealt with in CDAS is something that we'll check. Uh, also about uh, signal to, to noise, I think that's what the question is about. Uh, mm -hmm. That also we will have to check. So the questions that we have not answered here, we will check with CDAS team and make sure that they are uh, answered here. Um, also, um, Sherry and I, we both really want to thank Daniela Gerlin. She has been a great help in every way for this webinar. So thank you, Daniela. Great. And Amita, I just want to thank you for, again, being such a great webinar partner, co-instructor in this. I will miss working with you, but it has been a wonderful time um, building this webinar series together. I really appreciate it. And of course, our work would not be possible with all behind, scene, behind the scenes efforts of Brock, Elizabeth, and Selwyn, and many others who make our materials go from what we think is presentable to something that is the beautiful branded effort of the RCET webinar series program. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone, and we look forward to seeing you again on another webinar series. Thank you, everyone.